So individual variability is everywhere, uh, but in human society, there is not a high level of tolerance for that. Hello, and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Today, we welcome Dr. Franz de Waal to the podcast. Dr. de Waal is a Dutch-American biologist and primatologist known for his work on the behavior and social intelligence of primates. He is a professor in Emory University's psychology department and the director of the Living Link Center at the Yerkes National Primate Research Center. Chimpanzee politics, the age of empathy, the bonobo, and the atheist, and Mama's Last Hug are among his most popular books that have been translated in over 20 languages. His most recent book and the topic of our conversation today is called Different, Gender Through the Eyes of a Primatologist. In this episode, I talked to Franz de Waal about a very emotionally charged topic among humans, sex and gender. As a primatologist, he shares his unique perspective and research findings on the biological differences between male and female primates. Dr. Franz de Waal clears up what alpha male really means and debunks the natural order of male supremacy. We also touch on the topics of socialization, power, altruism, reproduction, and equality. Personally, I found this a really interesting and fascinating conversation with a really nuanced, thoughtful, reflective scientist. What I really like about his perspective is he doesn't take any of these extreme stances that you tend to see today on Twitter, for instance, and instead he really tries to think through what we can all learn from looking at other animals about how to treat humans, our fellow humans. I found it really interesting, for instance, that despite obvious distinctions between masculine and feminine behavior in great apes, they have no trouble accepting non-gender conforming individuals. It's not the great ape that needs to change, but it's the other great apes that show tolerance to who the great ape already is. I wish we saw a lot more of that kind of acceptance among humans, let me tell you. I also wish we saw a lot more of the kind of complexity of thinking that Dr. DeWall shows. What I really like about him is that he really values the science and takes the biological influence on behavior very seriously, but he also believes in equality, and he argues that these things are not at odds with each other, and I couldn't agree with him more. So now I bring you Dr. Franz de Waal. Uh, remind me, has your book officially come out yet? Yep, it's out. Congratulations. How are you feeling about the reception of it so far? Well, everyone who reads it, has, uh, it hasn't reached a ton of people yet, but uh, everyone who reads it is positive. I, I just saw today a very positive review in, um, in the TLS, what is a Times Literary Supplement. So that was good. Good. Yeah. I mean, it brings together lots and lots of ideas that you've had throughout your course of your career. And it really has a lot of pertinence to the cultural wars going on right now and lots yeah. of discussions uh, that are the foremost front of the world. It must be interesting as a primatologist to watch all this going on and, and you're like, oh, humans. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a lot of bad stuff going on as well, you know, so. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, let's uh, start off by, can you just, just define to our audience what a primatologist is? A primatologist is a student of primate behavior and ecology and sometimes neuroscience and physiology. So it, it was a very broad definition related to non-human primates. But most of us, when we say I'm a primatologist, they mean behavior and cognition, that kind of area. So more the psychology, actually, and the evolution of primates. But you, you're you interested as well in comparisons to humans, right? I mean, you must have really interesting conversations with, like, evolutionary biologists in your department, and right? Yeah, I'm very interested in humans. I, I consider humans also primates, of course. That's true. And so uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I look at humans uh, in, in that light, and I think uh, that comparison... I, I'm a biologist by training, and so I'm interested in all sorts of animals. But um, obviously, with the primates, the comparison is much more easy to make, I think. Uh, yeah. You say that primatologists don't worry about the desirability of behavior, but rather try to describe it best we can. And then you say, I sincerely believe that the best way to achieve greater equality will be to learn more about our biology instead of trying to sweep it under the rug. There are a lot of attempts to, to sweep biology under the rug in the science. That's very well-meaning attempts at equality. But you argue in your book in, in various ways that they actually um, are misguided in, in some ways. Is that right? Yeah, I don't think you can get around human biology. If people try to do that, it always backfires, I think. In the gender debate, of course, what we see is that people embrace biology when it comes to gender identity and homosexuality. 
because they use biology as an argument against those who say you have to change and you, your behavior is not acceptable. And they argue from biology saying that we are born that way, you know, this is a biological thing. But as soon as we get to gender of the large population, then uh, gender has become, uh, biology has become sort of bad word to use. Like mm. if you say uh, females are different from males in their behavior naturally, mm. um, that's really not very well accepted. And so biology is used in the ideological debate dependent on whether it's useful or not useful. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, as a biologist, feel you need to use it in, in all domains. And, and we need to have a science uh, that tells us what the sexual differences are uh, and, and go with that. And um, the, the interesting thing for me in writing this book was that there, there are some differences that are assumed that I think are nonsense. So there are some biological differences that people propose, like, let's say, Men are more hierarchical than women, things like that, which I don't believe in at all. But, but they propose these things. And then at other times, they, um, they deny differences that are pretty obvious. Like, for example, in the play behavior of the young primates, we see differences that are very similar to the play behavior that we see in boys and girls. Uh, and, and I don't see why would you deny that kind of differences that we see. Yeah, you're making really excellent points. A lot of it does seem to be the arguments are made based on ideological lines, not uh, uh, the actual facts of the matter. Um, you know, a very, very hot button topic is is uh, transgenderism, right? And mm -hmm. you talk in your book about, you know, well, let me ask you, you know, how can our findings about our understanding of biology and from a primatology perspective, how do you view um, uh, transgenderism? Well, Transgender uh, persons, they, usually this starts very early in life. That's why I don't think it's, it's, it's a sort of fashion because people sometimes present it now like that is that, um, it, it's a sort of whim that arises during puberty or something. No, it often starts far before puberty in most cases. And, uh, it is irreversible, which already hints at a deeper cause than just a cultural indoctrination or something like that. Uh, and then we have evidence from brain studies that uh, that the brain is involved and that that a certain area in the brain which is different in uh, trans women than in uh, uh, cis cisgender women. So um, that argues for biology. Uh, that that doesn't mean that culture cannot have an effect on it or the expression of it or the need to transition. Uh, all of that is probably culturally influenced. But, uh, uh, and culture has an influence on everything. But I think, um, transgender persons, um, we should, should respect that just as we did with homosexuality. For a long time, we have argued, of course, in society that homosexual behavior could be changed. Uh, and now, uh, we realize that that's not really a good possibility. Very interesting. Yeah. So for me, you know, I'm, I'm from the Netherlands and debate about homosexuality I've never understood because homosexual love was um, legal in the Netherlands for, for more than two centuries. And so when I came to the U.S. and noticed that um, there were so many objections to it, uh, I had trouble uh, understanding that. Um, but we, we went through the same debate there, I think, uh, that we're now going through with uh, transgender uh, people. Well, there's something, uh, you know, humans, there's something about our consciousness and our ability to even cognitively represent identity that is different from orangutans, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, I mean, when you look at other species, I feel like it is very cut and dry what's a male and what's a female. I don't feel like there are debates within the orang orangutan community of, you know, I don't feel like, you know, orangutans are disagreeing the nuance with each other about what, which is the male and which is the female of the species, right? But humans are very complicated. But the apes do have uh, exceptions to the rule. So, so that's the interesting part. So, so even though they may not be debating them and they may not be putting labels on them, which I think is something we humans are so strong at, you know, making labels. Uh, I describe in my book a female chimpanzee named Donna who is born as a female, is clearly a female. Um, but from a very young age, she acted like a little male. Hmm. And she liked to wrestle with males. She liked to, to invite the alpha male to wrestle with, which, you know, the adult males don't usually play with young females. That's something they do with young males, but not so much with young females. 
And so she was from the very beginning different. And then she grew when she reached adolescence, you know, 12, 13 years old. She, um, she grew into a robust male. She had bigger shoulders. She had more hair. She had a bigger head, bigger hands. She grew into a male-like uh, character. And she associated with males. She acted like the males. She associated with them. And from a distance, if you didn't know better, you would say she was a male. Of course, I cannot ask her her gender identity, and, and I don't think that's an issue that we can discuss about the primates. But she um, she was clearly uh, an individual who didn't fit the binary so 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 nicely. And so, with, for example, with gender as opposed to sex, I usually like to make the division between masculine and feminine. For sex, I'm I, I'm I'm okay with a dis distinction male and female, and we do that in biology, of course. But yeah. for gender, I I prefer masculine, feminine, and clearly that female Donna, she was more on the masculine end of things. Wow, yeah, no, it's a great point, and uh, and well, sorry, her, uh, her name was Donna, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, so maybe I say his name was Donna. If we could actually a ask him, he maybe he would give I, us the, yeah, him, pro him pronoun. But uh, but mm -hmm. this is so interesting because even taking the uh, the gender identity out of the equation, there seems to be um, sets of behaviors that seem to um, go in one direction or the other in terms of how they are perceived by others. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. so there's just deep implications for your research. And it's just so fascinating to look what we see when we see other species having similar behaviors, but without the cognitive representation of identity you know, that they, they, yeah. they obviously are missing. Yeah. So, the, so one of the things we humans do is we, we label. So we say, you're a man, you're a woman, you're heterosexual, you're homosexual, and you need to fit in these boxes. And if you don't fit in the boxes, you're sort of out of luck in our society. We're not very tolerant in that regard. Mm -hmm. And the difference with the other primates is that uh, they don't do the labeling. They don't have the boxes. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're not intolerant. They, 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 For example, Donna was extremely well integrated in her group. So mm -hmm. no problem at all, even though she acted quite differently from other females. I've also known males who um, don't act like uh, the typical male. They're, for example, they may be big males, but they are not interested in the macho games of who's going to be dominant and stuff like that. They stay out of all of that. Um, they're sort of sidelined in that regard um, by themselves, and, and they're also perfectly well accepted. So um, the intolerance in humans, uh, sometimes I wonder where that comes from. Mm -hmm. There's always individual variability. And in biology, we're very used to that. Uh, so, so you don't need the gender concept to talk about variability because you look at two trees in the forest of the same species and they're going to be different from each other. We, we are very used to that in biology. So individual variability is everywhere. Uh, but in human society, there is not a high level of tolerance for that. Mm. Yeah, excellent point. You break down a lot of misconceptions in your book, um, and I just want to go through them. One of them is that male supremacy is the natural order. Some humans might hold that belief. What would you say to someone who says that? You know, uh, how would you set them straight? Yeah, so there, there are several ways of doing that. <laughs> Since in my book I compare us with bonobos and chimpanzees, which are our two closest relatives, and they're exactly equally close to us mm -hmm. uh, in DNA terms. Uh, I, I have a, there's a very easy argument. The bonobo is female dominated and the chimpanzee is male dominated. So already mm. in our closest relatives, the picture is not that clear, you know? Mm. But even if I would go to chimpanzees alone, where the males are dominant, physically dominant, mm. I know many high ranking females who are very powerful. So my previous book, Mama's Last Hug, was about a female chimp named Mama who was for 40 years, she was the alpha female in a colony of chimpanzees. So she was not physically dominant over the male. She could not be, beat up a male, so to speak. But she had more power than the males. So, so each male who wanted to be the alpha male would have to court mama because that female ran the female show. And if all the females put their weight behind a male, he could become alpha male. And so she was instrumental also in the male politics. So in a group where the males are physically dominant, I always make a distinction between dominance and power. Mm -hmm. You may have individuals who are physically dominant but don't have the power. Someone else has the power. And in humans, of course, sometimes people are surprised by that. But in humans, we're very used to that. You, you walk into a business in New York 
and let's say you want to speak to the boss, you don't walk up to the biggest fellow in the store and think that must be the boss. That's not your assumption. Your assumption is the boss could be someone else, could be an older man or a woman. Uh, all of that is possible. And in, 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 a, in a chimpanzee society or bonobo society, the same thing. You cannot tell from just from a distance who's going to be the boss. It's not a physical feature necessarily. Uh, and, and, and power is, is such a thing. Power is a thing that is hard to measure. It's harder to measure than physical dominance, but uh, there are lots of females who, who have a lot of power. And uh, so all the primate groups, and this also applies to monkey groups, you know, all the primate groups have an alpha female, and there's female politics too, and there's female leadership too. So interesting. In the psychological literature, Jessica Tracy and her colleagues make the, make the distinction between authentic and hubristic pride and have argued that they evolved on different paths. Like, um, and they, they also make, there's um, researchers like Chang et al. who make the distinction between dominance and prestige as two routes mm -hmm. to social status. Sounds like you see the same two routes to social status in other species as well. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, prestige is interesting because prestige is conferred by the outside. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I, I, it's not like I can I can physically coerce you in, into uh, in my prestige, so to speak. That's not a possibility. The prestige comes from the outside who admires me. For example, admiration is part of that. The celebrities have prestige, for example. So we did one time an experiment with chimpanzees where we – uh, looked at um, would they imitate an individual based on their status. And so we had um, a high-ranking female who would show how to do a certain thing to get food and a low-ranking female who would demonstrate how to get food. And, and they demonstrated equal amounts of times and equally visible to everybody and so on. Uh, and the mass of the colony followed the high-ranking female. They ignored what the low ranking was doing, even though that was equally successful. They followed the high ranking female. And so prestige affects in the sense of um, following the example of, which is often what that is, can be found in the other primates. I mean, there's, there's implications here for a lot of ways of thinking about uh, mating in, in among humans, right? There's this notion of the alpha male. Right? Maybe we can talk about what is the alpha male in other species? Is it what? Because a lot of people think of it through the dominance angle, yeah. like only like big muscles, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And aggression and brute force. But there's there's multiple pathways to mating, right? Please tell me, please tell me there is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the word alpha male actually became popular after I wrote chimpanzee politics, and and chimpanzee politics was introduced to Washington by Newt Gingrich. Mm of all people. And after that, the term alpha male, since I had used it repeatedly in the book, um, became more and more used. And then it entered the business literature. The, and, and in the business literature, alpha male means the guy who beats up everybody and lets them know every day who's boss and has the biggest office and the biggest parking spot. And, and uh, that's a macho, macho alpha male. And I, I think it's extremely unfortunate because for me, that's not necessarily the alpha male. Each group of primates has one alpha male and one alpha female. It's not a personality type. It's just a top position. And that position is associated with some responsibilities. We do have bullies sometimes. Also in chimpanzees, for example, we may have an alpha male bully who terrorizes everybody. That occurs. Uh, and those individuals don't always end well, I must say. Sometimes there's a revolt against their behavior. Yeah. Um, but we, most of the time, most of the alpha males that I have known are individuals who keep the peace. So they break up fights in the group. They protect the underdog. They protect a juvenile against an adult or a female against a male. They protect the underdog. They show empathy for others. They reassure others who are distressed. And as a result, a good alpha male can become an extremely popular character. So, so he's groomed by everybody. Everybody loves that male. And if he's ever challenged by a younger male, uh, the group will put their weight behind him because they want to keep a male like that. So uh, I've known very popular alpha males. And so that idea that the alpha male must be feared rather than respected, you know, mm. as Machiavelli would say, um, that is a wrong idea. And, and, and so it's a simplistic idea. And then you have alpha females. Alpha females like Mama, who, who also keep the peace in their way. They don't step in when a conflict is going on because 
that's a dangerous enterprise and, and that's better done by a male. But they, they step in afterwards. They come in afterwards. If individuals have had to fight and they're not reconciling, the alpha female may come in and pull at her arm and make them move to the other and bring them together and wait till they groom each other. And when they groom each other, she walks away. And so she sort of has a healing role in the group. Oh, and, and the male, the alpha male can have a healing role in the group too. Yeah, both right. of them. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. If, if, you, if you have a group with a, a good alpha male and alpha female, they become a team very often. Well, then that's where all the power is at that moment. Yeah. You've seen power couples among orangutans. You're like, wow, that's a power couple right there. <laughs> well, orangutans are, are pretty solitary animals, so um, they, they are not as social as the bonobos and the chimps. The chimps. Yeah, I don't know why all my examples keep coming uh, around to orangutans. I think I just like the word orangutan. It's a good word. Yeah, it's a <laughs> nice word. word. It's a good word. You say we cannot just go around the animal kingdom and pick and choose which species we like the best. I thought this was a good one, too, because some people will be like, oh, we're more like bonobos than chip because we want we want to see ourselves in a positive light, you know, and, and we also can denigrate like chimps. And so I, I really like that quote for that reason. <laughs> well, there is a, there is wishful thinking. And so if I describe bonobos and say that they're female dominated, the females are collectively dominant in the bonobo because they have a sisterhood and they support the females support each other very strongly. Uh, and, and, and I describe all the sexual behavior of the bonobos. Then people say, I'm, I'm more like a bonobo. Uh, or, or why aren't we more like bonobos? Mm. Uh, and, and, and there's many men, of course, who don't like bonobos for that reason. And they would rather be a chimpanzee, I think. And, and I've had reactions like that. Is this, uh, one time I gave a lecture about bonobos mm. uh, for a German audience. <laughs> and an older professor, a male professor, stood up and said, what's wrong with those males? And, and so he, he clearly felt that the males were not doing their job in, in the bonobo society. So, so people um, associate like that. But for me, they're both fascinating animals, and, and I like both of them very much. Uh, and uh, I'm not making a choice between them. No. Yeah, I wonder if any bonobos, if they could talk, they would identify as chimps. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, the the male female thing. I'm. It's just. It's really. There's so many complexities to the issue because you are also arguing there is there are real biological differences between males and females. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you even, you said, you say, I've never heard anyone say, you know, I follow, I followed male and female orangutans to the forest and find their behavior to be so strikingly similar. So you, you do clearly see differences if you just reduce sex to genitals, right? Mm -hmm. Like you still see striking differences. Is that right? Yeah. There's, the, there's plenty of differences. One of the biggest ones is violence level. So, so the level of violence in all human societies, you look at the homicide statistics of any nation, it's more men than women, mm -hmm. physical violence. And in all primates, it's more males than females. So, so it's very hard to argue in that case that, that that's not a biological thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and the same is true for the play behavior. I described the play behavior of young males and young females. Young females very infant oriented. They love to put their hands on the infants of, of newborns, of mothers. And, and later, if they are more skilled, they become the babysitters for those infants, you know. And, and if you give them dolls, they like to carry dolls and hold them and, and put them on their back and things like that. And in the wild, they pick up wooden logs and rocks and carry them like dolls. Uh, so uh, there's, there's an enormous fascination with infants in the young females which makes sense given that the rest of their life they will be caring for offspring. And there's an enormous fascination with young males for mock fighting and, and roughhousing and uh, what we call rough and tumble play. And that has also been found all over the world to be done more by boys than by girls. Um, and it, certainly in all the primates, the, the young males do more of it than the young females. And it explains also somewhat, I think, the sex segregation that we see in play behavior mostly it's young males who play with males and young females who play with females. It's because the females don't like this rough play that the males are doing. So it's too rough for them. And there's some exceptional females like Donna, who I described, who like to be in the, in that mix. Yeah. But um, 
it, I think it, it ex explains to a large degree the sexual segregation that we see on the playgrounds in humans too. So interesting. So do you think that uh, there's benefit in, among humans if you are uh, biologically male in terms of uh, med medical sex, you know, um, and, uh, at, and, and you feel psychologically you are the other gender, you think there's benefit in, in is there benefit in calling yourself the other gender as opposed to saying, well, I'm just male with female characteristics uh, mentally and psychologically. I think that's yeah. the crux of the debate, right? Yeah, I think the gender identity arises very early, uh, long before puberty. And um, so, so it's not really hormonally driven, I think. Uh, and it results often in what I call self-socialization. So the typical self-socialization in children and in young primates mm. is that you look up at adults of your own sex. So, so young males look at adult, uh, young male chimpanzees look at a, the adult males around and they mimic their behavior. And the young females usually mimic the behavior of their mom, which is, which is the adult female around. And transgender children are set to identify more with, um, individuals of the opposite, adults of the opposite sex, and they mimic their behavior. So they self-socialize. I think self-socialization is an underestimated feature of, uh, because we always think of socialization as a one-way street. The adults socialize the young ones, but I think the young ones socialize themselves by mimicking the behavior, mimicking the example, and, and modeling themselves on adults, mostly of the same sex, but sometimes like in the transgender children, of the opposite sex. And in the primates, we have evidence for that as well. So you, you want a orangutan example? <laughs> <I'll give laughs> you orangutan. In, in orangutans recently, a study demonstrated that the young females, they eat exactly what their mother eats. You know, in the forest oh. of orangutans, there are thousands of plants, some of which you should not eat, some of which are the best to eat and fruits. Uh, and the young females, they copy exactly the diet that their mom has. Mm -hmm. Young males have a different diet. And that is because they watch adult males who come through. They don't live with them, but they come through on occasion. And they watch very closely what these guys are eating. And so, um, and we have other evidence. We have evidence of tool use um, in the primates where young females mo copy what their mom is doing and the young males uh, don't. And so I think self-socialization is a powerful concept and it applies equally to uh, the primates as to us. And, and to a large degree, I think primates, and that's why I use the word gender for them as well, they learn their sex roles also from watching adults. So it's not just that um, they are born with certain behavior, as people often assume that the other primates must be, you know, uh, they have innate behaviors. I think there's a very strange assumption. A, a chimpanzee is adult when he's 16, so, of course, he has an enormous learning period, uh, and, and he is just as much influenced by the environment, I would say, as a human child. And so the, the gender concept can be applied there as well. Okay, so you could see a case in which, uh, do you think if Donna could speak and, uh, and could self-identify, uh, do you think her life would be made easier and uh, her well-being would be improved if if she if, if she could say I'm I am a, a male and my pronouns are him, um, you know? Like I mean, that, I think that's just the crux of the question among humans, and I'm wondering a primatology perspective on that, you know, because there's different pathways one can take when they have such a great mismatch between mind and body. One pathway is to just say I'm female, but I really I'm very masculine in lots of ways. Um, another way is to do complete gender surgery, right? Reconstruction surgery. There are different pathways. Uh, can we glean any insights at all from looking at other animals? I find that very difficult. The, the, the point to make about Donna is that she was extremely well integrated. Mm, already. So, yeah. So in, in human society, maybe because of the the awkwardness or intolerance that occurs, you know, but uh, she had no problems at all in her life as, with, with that issue, I think. And, and I think if you ask me which kind of individuals would primates ostracize or exclude, I would say probably only troublemakers, individuals who cause trouble and, and upset everybody with aggressive behavior, for example. Oh. There I could see an exclusion. But for other reasons, 
I, I find it hard to imagine. So, so I also use the example in my book of, uh, of racial intolerance. Mm. So, so in humans, because we label everybody, black, white, whatever we do, yeah. I think that doesn't help in our case. But there is a species of uh, spider monkey, where, which is called the variegated spider monkey, where you have individuals from almost white to almost black. You have all the color variations in between. And in captivity, I know that these individuals get along fine. They do perfectly fine uh, if you mix them together. But I asked recently a field worker who works with them in Colombia in the field. And he says in the, in the wild too, these, these color variations are all over the place and they're all mixed together. And he's never noticed that it makes any difference to them. And so, um, the level of tolerance in primate societies is actually a bit higher, I would say, than in human society. And that's, we are conformists and we insist on rules and we, we label. And I think some of, some of that is related to our linguistic capacities, which are, of course, wonderful and give us a lot of benefits. But uh, they also um, undermine us a few things in society, I would say. Yeah, like our psychological categorization abilities evolved um yeah wow that is really um really mind-blowing it's almost like humans are even the opposite like we extol the troublemakers and and we they, they're the ones that trend on twitter you know they're the ones that get the attention whereas yeah. um intol you know the intolerant people you know can even be elected into political offices <laughs> for instance yeah. so wow it's just so 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 interesting i really appreciate your answer by the way it really um it really uh, opened up my mind um, to the way the humans are and the way the humans don't really have to be. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'd like to talk about your disagreement with Richard Dawkins, oh. uh, his notion of selfish genes and that, uh, we, uh, really aren't a communal, uh, cooperative species. You say we are an ultra social animal with solid communal values. So can you kind of explain to me this difference in perspective between yeah. the selfish gene view and your view? It's a bit odd because um, Richard Dawkins is a student of Nico Tenberger. Nico Tenberger is a Dutch ethologist, and I'm an indirect descendant, too, That's of true. Nico Tenberger. That's true. So we are from the same school, and I understand his arguments very well, his arguments in the selfish gene. And as far as the biology is concerned, I have no trouble at all with his argument, uh, of evolutionary argument about gene evolution. Um, but... When you call genes selfish, you're using a metaphor. And he says that on occasion in his book, it's a metaphor. So, so they're metaphorically selfish. They cannot be really selfish because selfish is a psychological characteristic. And um, genes are just little chunks of DNA, so they cannot have that. But he uses that metaphor. And then sometimes he gets carried away by his own metaphor. And this happens to his followers also. So, so they go from our genes are selfish to we are selfies, our psychology is selfies. And that's why in his book, at some point, he says, you shouldn't expect any kindness or altruism from the human species naturally, because that's uh, our biology is not made that way. I don't know what the exact quote is, but that's how he says it. And, and this, uh, this he has said repeatedly, is that you, you, you shouldn't get your hopes up about human altruism because um, we are born selfies. And so that's where he all of a sudden falls into the trap of his own metaphor. And, and and I had a discussion with him when he came one time to Atlanta. I had a discussion with him about that and saying that that he should have spoken of the self-promoting gene. That would, would have been more correct than the selfish gene uh, because he people confuse it with human psychology, basically. And what he then he answered in that uh, interview that we did, that maybe the genes are misfiring when you see altruistic behavior, because I described to him a few scenes in among the chimpanzees where, where sometimes, you know, the chimpanzees sometimes help individuals who can never help them back. So, for example, we had an old female in the chimpanzee colony who could barely walk anymore and was, and was nearly blind. And so each time she would try to go to the water faucet to drink, younger females would run ahead of her because hmm. they were much faster run ahead of her, suck up water, then return to her and spit it in her mouth. Or if she would try to join a group of chimps grooming, they would push her up. They would push her up into the climbing frame where these individuals were sitting because she could not get there anymore. 
And, and she was so old and she, of course, she died a couple of months later. She was so old that there was really no way she could pay them back. But um, that's what they were doing for her. And I, I described that to uh, Richard Dawkins. And he, he was speaking of misfiring genes. <laughs> misfiring. Which, which to me is, I don't even know what that are, misfiring genes. But yeah, so um, that was my disagreement with him. I think his, his book opened the eyes of many people to evolutionary processes, but uh, it was also misleading on, on the human psychology part. Mm, thank you. I appreciate that. Stephen Jay Gould called the female clitoris a, quote, glorious accident. Is that true? Yeah, that was a discussion of maybe 15 years ago, maybe more, where it was proposed by Elizabeth Lloyd, I believe, a philosopher, was proposed that the clitoris was a byproduct. It was, it's like the human male nipple has no function, you know, all the primate males have nipples, a gorilla male has nipples too, uh, and these nipples have no function. And, and the clitoris was a bit like that. The clitoris was there because males needed a penis. And, and that's why females got a clitoris, but it serves no purpose. So that's why Gold called it a glorious accident. But now we know we have actually much more knowledge of the clitoris. Uh, from anatomical studies, we know that the clitoris has as many nerve endings as the penis. Mm. Uh, and is served by big nerves, which carry that information to the brain. And so the clitoris is not just, uh, it's not like the, the, the male nipple. Uh, the clitoris is a functional part of the female body. And for example, bonobo females have a very large clitoris. Dolphin females have the largest clitoris in, in the animal world. All mammals, ma the mouse and the elephant, all mammals have a clitoris. Hmm. And so the clitoris is uh, functional and, and it, it relates a bit. And th that's the discussion in my book. It relates to female sexuality. Female sexuality has been traditionally downplayed by the biologists, by everyone actually, not, ju not just the biologists, but it's a sort of the Victorian view of female sexuality is that the males are sexually interested and have a sex drive. The females are sort of the passive recipients of, of sexuality. And, and that view is so incorrect. Um, it's also incorrect for birds. It's, it's incorrect for lots of animals. But in the primates, for example, females are sexually quite active. Now, I'm not just talking about bonobos, where the females are sexually assertive, I would even say. <laughs> but uh, in, in many primates, the females are very enterprising um, sexually. So the clitoris plays a role in that, I'm sure, in, in that it makes sex more pleasurable. Uh, female primates also masturbate, which which they wouldn't do, I'm sure, if there wasn't some sort of associated feelings with it. And so, um, um, yeah, the clitoris as glorious accident. There was a discussion from long ago, but as I think we have different ideas now about female sexuality. Yeah, within this, uh, the domain of the mating game, you argue that it's a myth that, that the females are always demure. Right, and I love how you brought in Abraham Maslow there because that's um, uh, one of my intellectual heroes, and I actually oh, okay. re actually revised his hierarchy of needs in my most recent book. And I really like you know how you brought his idea of um, of talking about uh, monkey self confidence, you know, yeah. and how it's related to human self esteem. I worked at the facility. You know, he was, I believe, a student of Harry Harlow. He was, yeah. Harry school. Harlow was his, his uh, mentor. Yeah. yeah, so I worked at the Wisconsin Primate Center for 10 years, wow. and I worked at a facility at the Vilas Park Zoo, uh, where he also watched monkeys. Mm -hmm. And and so that's how I got into the history of of uh, Maslow. And, wow. and if you read his early articles, he started out with being impressed by the dominance of monkeys mm -hmm. and, and the self-confidence of the alpha male monkey. And then he, later he developed his ideas about self-esteem. And, and I think there's a sort of, Continuity between these ideas. So, so the self-confidence of the male monkey sort of became internalized and that, that then leads to self-esteem. So I, f I found that so interesting. And, um, I, w I worked on the same monkeys and I worked on rhesus monkeys. And I describe in my book, um, the fascinating observations there that we had a, an old male who was the alpha male of the, of the troop, uh, a big troop, like a hundred monkeys. And, um, but he could not handle the younger males and the younger males were faster and stronger probably. 
uh, he, he didn't know what to do with them. But each time a younger male would challenge him, the alpha female of the troop would walk up to him and stand right next to him. Hmm. And that would stop the younger males. The younger males would not dare to proceed with the alpha female standing there because he, she had a whole army behind her, so to speak. And um, so that's another indication. I, we talked about that before of a female who has a lot of power, you know, and so I'm very used to that also in the monkeys. Well, um, I did a quite deep analysis of Maslow's own psyche, and he was quite obsessed with dominant females. Um, oh. his, yeah, because his mother was a very dominant female. Oh, look at uh, that. I didn't yeah, even know it. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And he wrote papers about about that, about, and he said that was a very under-researched topic of investigation where dominant females and yes, yeah, so this is uh, something that he was very, very interested in that mm -hmm. uh, idea. So what is the evidence that the sex drive of women may match that of men? Because there is this idea that uh, men have a much, much greater sex drive. And, and then a lot of reviews in the field of evolutionary psychology show in lots of different ways that that is the case. But you're, you're saying we may need to rethink that a bit. I think so. I, I've seen that literature on, on the male sex drive being stronger. And one of the arguments comes from data on masturbation, which, which is a way of measuring sex drive because masturbation is not constrained by the risk of getting pregnant or by um, finding a partner. Uh, so, so and, and men do clearly more of that than women. And I think uh, male primates do more of that than female primates. So, so that argument I can follow. But we also know that... Um, People lie about their sex lives. And, and so I, I don't know why psychology keeps trusting questionnaire methods. Uh, as you may have noticed, I'm not a big fan of it. Yeah. Um, so uh, because, for example, if you ask uh, men and women on campus, usually uh, students, usually you ask them, how many sex partners do you have or did you have in the last couple of years? The men have many more than the women which is really impossible. It's an impossibility uh, on a, on a, in an environment like that is that the men have many more sex partners than the women in, in heterosexual uh, interactions. Um, but if you hook up, you, you must know that study, if you hook up the women to a, a fake lie detector machine, all of a sudden they have equal numbers of sex partners than, than the man. I don't recommend doing that at home though. <laughs> it's a fake machine. Yeah. It's a fake, fake light detector fake, machine. Fake machine. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, so what that means is that people are not honest. Women, especially, are not honest about how many sex partners they have because there's a stigma attached in our society to women having too many sex partners. And mm -hmm. so, I, I don't trust questionnaire methods. Uh, I'm so glad I work with animals who don't fill out questionnaires and. Mm. I don't ask them how much sex they have. I just measure how much sex they have and with whom and so on. So, so, but the sex drive, I think sexual adventurism, as I call it, or sexual proactivity is very highly developed in the females. Whether, whether that, whether you call that the sex drive or not, uh, you know, um, that's a different thing. I don't know what the sex di drive exactly is, but, um, by some measures, I think men have a greater one, and by other measures, I think it's pretty equal between the two. Yeah, even in, in among uh, humans, you find that women tend to be more explorative sexually and have a more varied interest in terms of uh, different sexual things to try. Uh, there is some yes, research so. on that. Yeah. yeah, so for example, in chimpanzees, uh, it has been calculated that a female chimpanzee in the forest will have about 6,000 copulations in her lifetime. She, she produces about five or six children in her lifetime because, because there's a long interbirth interval and they have one kid at a time. So is, doesn't that look out of proportion, 6,000 copulations for five to six children? I think that is totally out of proportion. And so they don't have sex necessarily to make a baby, because if, if that was the case, they only would, needed to have sex like 20 times, 40 times, or whatever it is. Right. So, um, so clearly, there's something else going on with female sexuality. And, and there are theories about it. Uh, it would go too far maybe to go over all of them, but there are theories why females have more sex than is necessary for uh, their immediate reproduction. 
Um, yeah. W was this a bonobo uh, that you were referencing? That was a female chimp. That's for a female chimp. Yeah. Chimp? yeah. I, I, think think ben I think a bonobo would have far more than that. Yeah, and, yeah, and, more. And of, a, and of course, a bonobo would also have a ton of sex with other females, not just with males, but also mm -hmm. with a ton of females. Yeah, anything goes for bonobos. They're, <laughs> they're freaky. <laughs> wow. I'm not sure that that's freaky. They, for them, sex is part of their social life. It's very hard mm. to draw a line between social and sexual for the bonobo. And we should not, people often imagine, uh, and I'm partly responsible because I've popularized the sex life of the bonobo. Uh, people often imagine that they have sex the whole day, but you know, their sexual contacts are 10 seconds, 15 seconds. They're, they're brief. Uh, they're, they're, you, you better look at them as sort of handshakes or patting someone on the back or something. That's so interesting. Well, yeah, for the record, uh, freaky wasn't a negative connotation for me. <laughs> so <laughs> I just want to be clear about that. Um, was okay. no, no slight against the bonobos. Okay. Oh, okay. Have you read Dr. Susan Block's book, The Bonobo Way? Yeah, I know, I know about it. I know about it. Yeah. She loves that. She loves the bonobos. And she yeah, I know. Wants I humans. Know. You know, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, peace on earth, she thinks. Okay, so why have we underestimated the role of female choice? And you and you had a couple uh, reasons I thought were very interesting. You said chimpanzee females typically vocalize at the climax of intercourse, but never during a secret rendezvous. And you also say cultural reasons. Females are expected to be passive and coy, of course. Yeah, could you kind of just elaborate on some of these uh, reasons we underestimate the role of female choice? Well, I think cultural reasons, you know, the Victorian attitude that females ought to be passive, uh, I think that's at the root of everything. And then also we didn't have the evidence, you know. Uh, now we have paternity testing. We, we can do DNA testing. So, so one of the first findings was with birds. You know, monogamous birds, male, female, they have a nest with eggs. We always assumed that all these eggs are fertilized by the male of the nest. But now we know, it's paternity testing, that very often these eggs are fertilized by multiple males. And when people found that for the first time, they said, well, maybe these females get raped by somebody who comes through, you know, and that's that's all they could think of at that moment. Now we know that female birds, very often outside, it's called extra pair copulation, outside of the pair, they have sex with other males. And so we know now, by paternity testing, we know a lot about that. Uh, so for example, in the primates, the same monkey group that I worked with in Wisconsin was one of the first to have paternity testing, not even based on DNA, it was just blood groups, groups at the time. And they found... You know, if you look at a, at a group of rhesus monkeys, you think the alpha male does most of the copulations. So most of the kids that you see, most of the young monkeys, they are his. That's what we always assumed. And, and that study showed that, yeah, he had more offspring than other males, but only slightly more. Meaning that the females were arranging copulations with low-ranking males behind his back. Uh -huh. And that at night things were happening that we scientists didn't know about. Uh -uh. Um, and, and so paternity testing has opened up a new world for us, you know, and, and, uh, and we know a lot more about female sexuality as a result. And it's much more enterprising than people have assumed. Mm. These other animals, they're, they are sneaky. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, chimpanzees, they, they have very often rendezvous. Um, so, so the alpha male, of course, doesn't tolerate other males to copulate with females mm. in, in his view. So, so what females will do is they sneak up to a younger male who is not alpha male and they hang around him. And then at some point they split. The, the male walks up in this direction. Uh, and a few minutes later, the females walk off in that direction. So no one notices that they are getting together at a far away point where they have a very quick uh, copulation. I mean, this so is incredible. It's, it's all prearranged stuff that they do. And since chimps are good at planning and good at deception, uh, they, they get away with that kind of stuff. But what is their consciousness? They, they, they're not, uh, this is still instinct, right? I mean, it's, they're still genetic, uh, uh, sort of program there. I just, it's so fascinating to me how they can communicate with each other and have all this stuff without, without language, without all the things we have. Maybe I'm overplaying the, the capacities of humans here. 
Yeah, I, I'm not sure why you're saying it's still instinct because mm. it, the term instinct we barely use anymore with, with animals because there's always learning and intelligence involved in everything Good point. we do. Good, good point. And so, and so these chimps, the male and the female, both know what they want mm. and they both know how to get it. Uh, and they know that they should not draw attention to themselves, which, which is, they have learned the hard way. So, so simple associative learning right there. So, um, it's a combination of things, but, um, yeah, planning, we have good evidence for planning in animals nowadays, in birds and in primates. Uh, and, and that's what they do. They, they, they plot their escape. Yeah. It's just amazing how they can do all this without talking to each other. I'm saying like, it's like, it's, they don't say like, Hey, Mary, uh, meet me behind, you know, underneath <laughs> the bleachers at 4 PM. It, and they, they, but they, they somehow communicate to each other that that's where they're going to meet. And at when they're going to meet, it's just fast. But, but we, we humans can do the same thing with a few meaningful glances, you know, and and a little shake of the head. We uh, we can do similar things, you know. Wow. We don't need to talk for that. That's that's a good point. That's a very good point. Um, another thing, another uh, misconception that you um, that you clear up is the idea that female female competition doesn't exist. You say in all primates, males compete overwhelmingly with males and females with females. This applies equally to us. Psychologists downplay this among women. Um, I'm a psychologist, so I'm sorry on behalf of my species <laughs> of psychologists. Why do we downplay female female competition, and how can uh, how do we end up with this bogus gender dichotomy? Yeah, that's that's so surprising to me. Is that, you know, I'm a biologist who has lived for almost 30 years among psychologists. I'm a psychology professor, and so in psychology, sorry. There is a, a, a very positive opinion of women and a negative one of men. Hmm. For example, male friendships are not taken seriously because only women have real deep friendships. And the male hierarchy is emphasized, but the, that females have a hierarchy no one talks about. You know, the, the word pecking order comes from hens, not from roosters. All female animals have hierarchies and are competitive. And of course, in humans, uh, women are competitive with each other. So they have friendships, which is wonderful, but they're also competitive with each other. So, yeah, so yeah, in, in psychology, and, and for me, the fascinating thing is that in anthropology, we have exactly the opposite bias. In anthropology, always emphasizes male bonding and male rituals and the man's houses and hunting together and warfare together. So the male bonding is emphasized in the anthropology departments and the female bonding in the psychology departments. But, you know, all primates, uh, females are competitive with each other, more with each other than with males. And, and mm. males are more competitive with each other than with females. Um, and, um, yeah, that needs to be recognized. And, of course, people now recognize it. For example, bullying at schools and bullying on the Internet at Facebook, we now know... Clearly, that's not limited to 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 males. You know, that's not limited to males at all. Yeah, yeah. In terms of competition for meeting rivals, derogation of rivals is a big one among humans. Males will often compete with each other in ways that the women don't even care so much about it. Like, you know, making fun of each other's penis size, or like, or punching each other, and like, you know, who's the more muscular when. You know, it's just like a lot of men think what women want are the things that men are competing with each other for when that's often not exactly what women really want. And I, I find that interesting. Do you see that in other animals as well, that kind of uh, mating derogation of potential rivals? They don't have the language to do that. But, of course, the, the competition among males is more physical hmm. than among females. Hmm. And, uh, and also males develop different strategies. So, for example, chimpanzee males... They have a lot of conflicts, but they also reconcile quite easily. They reconcile afterwards, they kiss and embrace, then they groom. They get over it quite easily. I think for the female chimpanzee, the data indicate the females have a lot more trouble with reconciliation. And for that reason, the female strategy is largely to avoid conflict. So, so if it's hard to get over them, then the best strategy is to try to suppress them and stay away from your rivals. For example, males don't stay away from their rivals. They don't mind the conflict and they get over it. The, the females, they, they try to, I, I call it, the females have a keep, a peacekeeping strategy and the males have a, a peacemaking strategy. And oh. we, we know more about it in the primates than in humans. Unfortunately, for conflict resolution, which is one of my favorite topics, 
we have a bigger knowledge uh, uh, for the primates than for humans. I don't know why in humans that's not really studied so much, but I do know that in the business literature, I noticed that they talk about how women are more affected by conflict in a, in a corporation. Mm. So they ruminate more, they think about it more, they are more deeply affected by conflict um, and competition. So, so that may correspond a little bit with what I saw uh, among chimpanzees. Mm. Gosh, this is so fascinating. I could talk to you all day about this. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's so interesting. Uh, wh why is uh, the, the term the maternal instinct misleading? Ah, the maternal instinct is used all the time. I think there's an instinctual part, which is the attraction to infants, which you see in young females and in older females. Attraction to infants is maybe inborn or biological. You mean attraction to care for infants? Yeah, or yeah. hold them or yeah, yeah, see them, smell them, hold mm. them. But the, the care for infants, is not. no one is born with the skills. Hmm. So, so, for example, if you have a gorilla group at the zoo where there's a female pregnant and they have never had babies there, they know they're in trouble because that female will not do the right thing. She, she may even sit on the baby. Who knows what she's going to do, but she's not going to take care of the baby. And what a zoo will do under these circumstances is bring in a human mother who has a newborn hmm. and let her nurse in front of the gorillas. And she will do it every day and the gorillas will watch very carefully. And that may help them. It's not sure, but it may help them raise their own infant. So, so infant care needs to be learned. It's one of the most complex skills there is. How to carry them, how to feed them, um, how to punish them, how to all sorts of clean them. All sorts of things need to be learned. And uh, the primates uh, learn that usually when they're young, by watching mothers around them, but if they don't have that example, they are in trouble and they, they're not very good at child care. Um, just generalizing um, above to, to the, like, I guess this is a callback to the Dawkins disagreement. Are we, we are wired for cooperation in a lot of ways. We, are we wired um, at all to care for those who are in our out group? I think that's kind of the biggest thing in the world right now is that uh, when it comes to that that instinct, it's usually um, associated with oxytocin, um, associated with sort of that drive to help those in our in-group. But what we're suffering from a lot nowadays is is how much, if we perceive someone in our out-group, how much we kind of don't treat them as human anymore. We, yeah. won't even, we won't even agree with that. We won't even have discussions with them. And yeah, I just want to kind of understand how can we, is there an instinct at all for that? For, for, cause the maternal instinct seems like something different. That's like the, I would call that the in-group love yeah. instinct, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. So the, the maternal instinct, there's a lot of learning involved, but the in-group out-group distinction is very, you know, it's very profound in all sorts of animals, not just in our species. Hmm. And so uh, to overcome that is, is going to be very difficult. So for example, I've, done quite a bit of research on empathy in animals, uh, how they respond to the emotions of others and adopt the emotions of others. And and there's a very big in-group, out-group distinction right there. Uh, empathy is much e more easily triggered between individuals who know each other than individuals who don't know each other. Mm. And in the primates, in-group, out-group is defined by who you know. So, so it's not like um, your label of I'm... I am um, French and you are German. Or so. We don't have that kind of labels in the primates. It's who do you know and who, who is it that you don't know? And there's only one species that I know in our immediate relatives who is not xenophobic, and that's the bonobo. The bonobo females, since they have taken over and are maybe less territorial than the males, um, they mingle with their neighboring groups. So when groups meet in the forest, they mingle and they groom and they have sex and they hang out together. And we now have data that they sometimes share food with each other, that females may even adopt an orphan from a neighboring group and stuff like that. So female bonobos um, are not xenophobic, but chimpanzees are extremely xenophobic. They, they hate the other group and they will kill them. Wow. And they do that. They do that in the wild. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. So we need to harness more our more of our inner bonobo uh, <laughs> if we if we want to have world peace. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> wow. Okay, so let's uh let's just end on this uh, idea of how we need to move away from mind body dualism. I think that that's uh you see that as a big problem running as a thread running through lots of these misconceptions. So yeah, can you kind of um tell tell me your argument a little bit along those lines? 
Yeah, so the the mind body dualism is a is an old trope by male thinkers. Men think that they their mind is independent of their body, and that's why you have men, for example, who try to freeze their brain and preserve it because they hope that one day that brain will be revived, at least the content will be revived. So, so they they can imagine a life without their body. Um, uh, and 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 it has been used, of course, against women in the sense that. These all these thinkers they believe that the human mind, the male mind, is far superior to anything in the world, including um, women, including animals, including everybody else. And so, at some point, that dualism of mind, mind being dominant over the body, so to speak, mm-hmm. that dualism was adopted um, by the feminist movement and and. Uh, I think it's a second wave feminism and sometimes confuse the, the, the different waves, but I think it's second wave feminism that emphasized, um, how, uh, women should be become more intellectual equals to men. And, um, and, uh, the bodies were not terribly different only between the legs was something different, but for the rest, the bodies were not relevant to the, to the discussion. And so they focused on the mind. And, and I think that is very misleading. The mind is never independent of the body uh, and that man can think this is very logical because men don't have the, the hormonal cycles to deal with that women have, of course. And so then it's easier to think that your mind is sort of independent, but the mind is always part of the body because the mind is in the brain and the brain is the body. Mm. And um, this whole idea that you can sort of isolate your interest and your being and your identity from what your body is, is for me a, a very strange idea because your body is involved in everything you do and what you think. And even, even being hungry will, will enormously change your perspective on the world. And so your body is involved in everything. And, and we know that, for example, in psychology, embodied cognition is, is a, is a big area now. And the body is involved in everything in your psychology, in your thinking. And so running away from your body is, I don't think the solution to uh, the gender debates, and we need to recognize that the human genders, they are different, and their bodies are different, their minds are different. And what I argue in the book is, of course, that the difference doesn't mean that we need to accept inequality. As for me, if you take the two words gender inequality, the problem is not with gender. The problem is with inequality. That injustice and the inequality, that's where the problem is. And we can be perfectly equal, even though we recognize that there are certain biological differences. Yeah, yeah. We The problem is with us. The problem is the way we treat each other. Mm, yeah. yeah, it's becoming so clear to me after talking to you today about that. I'm going to quote, end with some quotes from you. You say, I would never want to live in a genderless or sexless world. It would be an incredibly boring place. It all comes down to mutual love and respect and appreciation of the fact that humans don't need to be the same to be equal. Um, thank you so much for coming on my podcast, but even more big thank you to being a legend in the field of primatology and um, influencing us psychologists in the okay. way that we think about this as well. Um, it's a, we owe a huge debt to you and uh, well, and also the field of primatology um, owes a huge debt to you. So just thank you so much for your existence thank in you. this world and the work you've done. You're welcome. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.